Uh, wonderful to have everyone here uh, this morning. If you're visiting with us, we're the Cape Town Church of Christ, and this is, this is my PowerPoint <laughs> uh, and my iPad as times have changed. Uh, uh, wonderful to have you with us. You know, it's, uh, obviously the weather is a little bit hot, so we made it in half an hour earlier. We almost started at 8 this morning, uh, but that would require the setup crew to come at about 5. Uh, which was a little bit on the early side. Uh, we did think, though, that it's actually... Whoops, there goes a the guitar. It is actually um, cooler outside than inside. Uh, so there is a niceness to it. Uh, that, be, that being said, we, we do want to, and this year, really work at meeting together. I know that is the oddest comment. I never, knew, I never thought that I would say a comment like that for church, that we're actually going to try and meet together. Uh, but... Uh, so we're looking at different options. The Department of Education in the Western Cape still does not allow people to meet in schools, so that's still a no for now. Uh, we are looking at the possibility of hiring other venues temporarily, okay, uh, that we can maybe meet in uh, because we want to meet consistently. Uh, while the government regulations allows us to meet, we want to meet. It far beats YouTube, uh, even with the heat and what have you. So if it is hot, obviously, please make sure that you do sit in the shade. Uh, make sure that you use sun cream, drink water, stay hydrated, uh, w whatever needs to be. Uh, and, and always think that, be glad that you're not doing the message because it's pretty hot over here. <laughs> it's pretty hot over here. So there's, there's, always, that, uh, there's always that positive side. Uh, uh, two things. So that being said, uh, I am happy to be here this morning, uh, happy uh, about the new year. Um, I think last year, as I've shared before, and I won't go into detail, but was definitely a, a very uh, difficult year for the false household, let's call it that. Uh, I won't go into all the detail, but most likely, and I'm, and I'm nervous in saying these things because two things. One is I want People to know my world is challenging like everybody else's world, but then also don't let them be overly concerned or, or nosy <laughs> as to what's happening in, <clears throat> in, in our family world. But that being said, last year uh, was most probably the hardest year that I've had in my spiritual life. Uh, without, I say most probably without a doubt, it, ha it has been. But here I am, still standing prayerfully, and will still prayerfully stand into this year. And I think it's that to a large degree that has also led us to the topic that we're studying and why we even do it in the sun is one of the questions, and I think a lot of questions have been asked through 2020, 2021 about our own faith. Who am I? I'm not sure if any of you have gone through that. Who am I? What am I a part of? What do I want to do? What is church? Okay, because what used to be a Sunday worship service has now become YouTube, uh, where the kids are running crazy, and you're trying to watch, and you can't connect, and you try like twice, and then call it a day, and take a sip of the communion cup, and uh, what have you. So I think there's been a lot of questions like that running through a lot of our minds. And what I've been thinking and praying about really for years, but has come more and, uh, into the pressure cooker of my own faith, if you may, in 2021, is why do you do what you do? Why do we serve God? And is God enough? Okay, so <clears throat> last year or the year before, we, and I've many a times in the last decade or two, spoken on Psalms like Psalm 23. It's 23 years. So it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Uh, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Uh, what is the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be on. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me be quiet, beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I dwell, move through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Okay. You're right on your staff. They comfort me. You lay a table in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my Head with will, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and your love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. I read a psalm like that, and I think, I want that. I don't want to have quiet times in the morning. I don't want to be a church goer. I want to have that. I want to be able to say with the psalmist, Yahweh is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He's enough. 
Psalm 27, 4, as we spoke about last week, one thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and seek Him in His temple. Saying that all I want to do, I'll be happy if I can gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and seek Him in His temple. If I can ask one thing, if you can ask one thing, what would it be? It says, the psalmist says, that it would be for me that I can dwell in the house of the Lord all my days of my life, to gaze, to gaze upon, to behold, to see the beauty of the Lord and seek Him in His temple. So that's what we are after here, okay? That is why and I, the need, which we'll get into just now, of reading the Bible supernaturally. So with that being said, introduction, 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 let's say a prayer and then we'll jump into the message. Father, we thank You for, although it's a hot day, a stunning day, uh, once again, just a reflection of your splendor, your beauty, and your majesty. I think you make it so easy for us as Capetonians uh, to just look around us and see you everywhere, Father. Not only in the beauty of our city and around us, but in the people of the city. And I pray this morning, as we sang that song, that you'll open the eyes of our heart. Help us to see you for uh, not who you are not, but for who you are not who we think you should be or could be, but for who you actually are. Uh, please lead me as I speak. I pray in your son's name. Amen. Okay, my PowerPoint, just give me one second as I grab it. Uh, Steph, can I just have that other clip that you had as well to clip things together? Okay, so reading the Bible supernaturally... What do I mean by that? I heard that a couple of people felt uh, overwhelmed by just reading the Bible supernaturally. Can't I just read it naturally? Supernaturally seems too supernatural. It seems beyond my ability. I can't read it that way. So let me just now, let me, let me hope that this all goes away. Uh, wh why reading the Bible supernaturally? What do I mean by supernaturally? Two things. One, that only God can help you to see the majesty, imagine this being a Bible, only God can help you see the majesty of what is there. Without that, this remains just paper, thank you, this remains just paper and ink. It's just words on paper. Unless those words are one, divinely inspired, and two, by God's supernatural power, He helps you to see what is there. So if I say supernaturally, I'm saying that it's actually not up to you, but up to God to help you see what is there. Two, that if I say supernaturally, when you start to see that majesty of what is there, it will have a continuous effect on you. By continuous, I mean not just five years ago, ten years ago, thirty years ago, when you first became a Christian and you're speaking about those days. Oh, I remember when I became a Christian and I saw and the effect that it had on me. But no, if I'm reading it supernaturally, regularly, it will have a continuous effect on me. And that effect that it has on me is in itself supernatural. <laughs> Meaning the effect that it has on me is not me. It's not the harder I read, the more intense I read, the longer I read. I'm going to see or it's going to have the effect on me. That's why it's supernatural. So that's why we're saying we need to learn to read the Bible supernaturally. Then last week we started looking at the aim of reading and spoke about the fact that although there are multiple reasons for us to open the Scriptures, to dig in and to read, the aim of seeing the supreme worth and beauty of our triune God should be in, under, over and through all those reasons. That, yes, I might look for guidance and what it is that I'm doing now for where I am in that dark valley, and I definitely want to seek that guidance. I want to know, what, is it, what does God want from me? How does He want me to live as a kingdom person? Yes, yes, yes. But underneath, over and through that all, I'm still seeking to see His supreme worth and beauty. The scripture that we're going to read this morning that I sent out via our communicator earlier this morning, and I think earlier the week, just to give us a heads up since we don't have PowerPoint, is one of, if you may, the most sweeping yet pointed texts in the Bible on the glory 
of God on seeing His supreme worth and beauty. It is sweeping because it reaches back, if you may, and let's see if we can find the PowerPoint here. It reaches back to the Old Covenant. This is PowerPoint people, we're living in the modern age. Okay, It reaches all the way back uh, to the Old Covenant with God giving the law or the Torah uh, to Moses right there in the beginning. Then it covers centuries long of reading that Torah till eventually, PowerPoint slide two, we reach the new. And it brings all of that together from one side to the other. And it's sweeping because it moves from this side to the other side. And yet it is incredibly pointed because what Paul is doing in this text is he's showing both in the old, the old way. Let me quickly touch on that. The Old Testament, the big part of your Bible, if you still have a physical one, the Old Testament, refers to the Old Covenant, which could mean the Old Agreement. So the old agreement that God had with his people, what it meant to be the people of God, is the Old Testament, New Covenant, New Testament, New Agreement. And in this text, Paul takes both the old and the new, and he uses the word glory, I think, what is it, 14 times in this passage, and he makes it clear that the glory of God, first in relation to the old, to the Torah, and then in relation to the new, is the primary concern of God in both testaments. So he says in 2 Corinthians 3, that should be on your phone that I sent out this morning, verse three, chapter 3, verse 7. The old covenant or the old way with laws were written in stone led to death. Though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at the face of Moses. For his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading away. <clears throat> so he's talking about when God gave Moses the instructions, the Torah, for what it meant to be his people. Uh, God met with Moses in a tent called the tabernacle. I think many of us uh, know that. And God's presence was in the tent. And then what the book of Exodus says, that when Moses would go into the tent to get this law that will ultimately lead to death, that couldn't bring life. Even though this law would lead to death, it says that it was so glorious what took place that whenever Moses had that encounter with God and God giving him that instruction, he would come out and his face would be radiant. The book of Exodus says so radiant that when the people saw him, they ran away because they were afraid. And Moses had to put a veil over his face so that one, they won't see the radiance, but also two, that they wouldn't see that it was fading away. For say, if that's the case back then, shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new covenant or the new way now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? If the old way which brings judgment was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way that produces covenant faithfulness? In fact, that first glory, the old one, was not glorious at all compared to the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way, which has been replaced, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way that remains forever? So he's comparing the two agreements, the two covenants, the two testaments, old and new. With regards to the old, he is saying that the glory of the old has virtually vanished when compared to the glory of the new. Although a candle can bring a lot of light into a dark room, as we experience through load shedding, its light vanishes when the sun comes out. He describes verse 10 saying, in fact, that first glory was not glorious at all compared to the glory of the new way. Now, that's pretty intense. He's saying, listen, here, if you look at the old way and what happened with Moses and the glory and the temple, the glory and the tabernacle, he's saying, in fact, that first glory was not glorious at all compared to the overwhelming glory of the new, the new way, the good news, Jesus. Now, that is pretty intense 
if you consider that he just said in verse 7 of the Old Covenant, he says that the Old Covenant began with such a glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face, for his face shone with glory. Again, he's referring back to what happened when Moses received the instructions from God in the tabernacle. So Paul is saying, there was glory in the old way. My guess is most of us, if we don't feel like reading our Bibles and we need to read something, we don't want to read the Torah. When I say, oh, you know, let me read a little bit of uh, Torah today. I want to see some glory. Okay. We tend to hop to the New Testament. He is saying there was glory in the old way. That glory was not nothing for the old way. That was the glory of God. So he's saying, don't diminish the glory of the old way, either back then or now. For to not see the value of the glory of the old way is to miss the meaning of it all, the old way, as well as to miss the surpassing value of the new way. Now, if I don't understand how glorious this way was, I will not be able to grasp how absolutely amazing the new way is. It says 4, verse 11, If the old way which was replaced was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way that remains forever? So the old way and the new way is not about glory or no glory, but it's about revealing different amounts of glory <laughs> at different times and at different settings. With God... There is always glory. There is always splendor. There is always wonder. There is always majesty. It is never minor. It is never insignificant. It is never negligible. There is always some measure of infinite value that is worth seeing, that is worth knowing, and that is worth loving. But in comparison with the glory of the good news of Jesus... He is saying the glory that was here in the old has virtually vanished. So, getting my PowerPoint. He is saying that in comparison to the 5 watt light bulb, this must probably be a 60 watt one, but we don't get them anymore. I didn't have time to get a little LED 5 watt light bulb, so just imagine. He says, in comparison to the five-watt light bulb of Netflix, TikTok, I'm not talking about TikTok, I'm talking about the app, Instagram, Facebook, my new car, new dress, new home, dream holiday, compare to the five-watt light bulb of those things, he is saying that the old covenant shined like a supernova, an exploding star. The, the, the very things that we so desperately pursue, he is saying, the old, the Mosaic Covenant, is like a supernova that just pushes this out of the way. So be careful, he is saying, that you don't diminish the glory of the good news of Jesus by diminishing the glory of the old way, which vanishes in relation to the glory of the good news. The point is not that candles go out when Jesus comes. The point is, this is not PowerPoint. The point is not that candles, the old, goes away when Jesus comes, the new. The point is that supernovas become like candles when Jesus comes. He's saying, that's what I want you to see about the glory of God. The glory of God in the Old Testament is not nothing. When we read the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, we should probably put on safety glasses. Unless... We are spiritually blind. We will not be hindered. We will not see anything. Tragically, 
most of Paul's Jewish audience in this time in the book of Corinthians were spiritually blind. He says their minds were, verse 14, their minds were made dull, hardened. And to this day, whenever the Old Testament is being read, the same veil covers their minds so that they cannot understand the truth. The veil has not been removed because only in Jesus is the veil taken away. Yes, even today when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil and they do not understand. He's saying back then for them, and even now, every time that they read, there was a slide for veil, but not anymore. Don't know what happens, my proper paradigm, picture veil. It says every time that they read, there is a veil that covers their minds and their hearts so that they cannot see. Now, this veil that they had did have still little holes in it, if you may, so that when they read it, they could see some truths of Moses, some truths of the old. There was still a little bit shining some facts through, some law through, but what they could not see was beauty. That is why several of the religious people of Jesus, they were so full of knowledge. They knew so much, natural reading of the Old Testament, and yet they could not see the wonder of God. Jesus said of them in Matthew 13, 13, he said, though seeing, though reading, they do not see. Though hearing, they don't hear, nor do they understand. But the veil that was over their eyes and the hardening that kept them from seeing the true nature of God's glory was not unique to Paul's day. He's saying it was also true for the people back in Moses' day, and it is also true for many of us today. Therefore, our greatest need today is to be able to read the Scriptures with eyes that can see. But how? How can I read with eyes that can see? He gives us in verse 16, he gives us the answer by saying, Whenever someone turns to Jesus, the veil is taken away. It says, whenever someone turns to Jesus, the ways of Jesus, who Jesus is, what God is doing for us in Jesus, whenever someone turns to Jesus, the veil is taken away, for Jesus is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and where the Spirit is, there is freedom. Somehow, when we turn to Jesus, the day that you became a Christian, the day that you started seeing things, and today, meaning this is not a once all for all moment. If I turn to Jesus, the veil would lift and I would see. If I turn away from Jesus, the veil would come back and I will not see. It will be boring again. That which I once loved. Turning to Jesus brings freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from the bondage of blindness and the hardness of heart and mind. Freedom to see. So Paul has shifted our focus from the old way, the old covenant, to the new way and the new covenant. From Moses to Jesus. From a veiled and temporary glory to an unveiled and permanent glory. And his central point in it all is that when the veil is lifted, when the hardening and the blindness is removed, we will see the glory of the Lord. We will see His supreme worth and beauty. And then he says in verse 18, And all of us who have had the veil removed can see the glory of Jesus and are being transformed, that supernatural part that I spoke of earlier, into His image with an ever-increasing glory which comes from my hard work, my effort, my niceness, which comes from the Lord, who comes from Jesus, who is the Spirit. The ability to see and behold the supreme worth and beauty of God in the Old Testament was a partial and fading experience. He says, now in Jesus, those who turn to Jesus, the veil is lifted. 
giving us the greater experience of the new covenant. Seeing the supreme worth and beauty of our triune God was and is and will always be of the uttermost importance. How were the people of the Old Covenant, Old Testament, supposed to see the glory of God? By reading the Torah, reading the Bible, reading their Old Testament. Has that changed? Paul's saying no. The only difference is that they read with a veil, and we don't have to. Once there was a window, if you may, with a curtain, he says, but the curtain has been opened. Once the glory of God was veiled in reading, now the glory of God is saying it's unveiled in reading. That is true for a new, you could say, spirit illuminated reading of the Old Testament, as well as reading the good news of Jesus and the New Testament. We can see. Now, that being said, obviously the fact that we can see doesn't mean that everyone sees it, for some remains veiled. He says in chapter 4, verse 3, if the good news about this glory, this unveiling that can be seen, that we preach is hidden behind the veil, it is only hidden for those who are perishing. Satan, who is the god of this age, who is rampant right now, has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the supreme worth and beauty of Jesus, who is the image of God. He's saying Satan is going out, and what he is doing every single day, every single moment that he's trying to do right now, that he's trying to do every morning that you open the Bible, he's trying to veil you and me so that we cannot see what is there. Because if we are able to see what is there, we will be, we'll need the safety glasses. We will be blown away. Do you guys see the sunset last night? Stunning. When you see it, what happens? You're blown away. And you say to others, come and see. Well, what does everyone do these days? Where's my phone? Let me take, I, I want others to see. Let me quit. And, you, and it doesn't compare. But I'm going to try. Take a quick pick. I want others to see. He is saying that to this day, again, Satan still blinds people so they don't see. So you're looking at your parents or you're looking at your friends and you're asking, why are they so crazy? They look ludicrous and the choices that they make and what they value and how they live. And the reason is because you don't see. If you've been asking yourself, why am I making these choices? Why am I making this? Why am I doing this? This doesn't make sense anymore. You have to ask yourself, do you still see? Is there a remedy? Thank God there is. He gives us a remedy in closing in verse chapter 4, verse 6. It says, for God has said, let light shine out of darkness has made his light shine into our hearts. So we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus. He is saying that God, through speaking a supernatural word as he did on the day of creation, gives to those that are blind the ability to know and to see the wonder of God. And where do they see and behold that wonder? He says, in the face of Jesus, by reading and seeking to see the supreme worth and beauty of Jesus. In other words, he supernaturally removes hardening. He takes away the blindness. He lifts the veil. He is the one that enables us to see his supreme worth and beauty. For those who want to, for those who turn to Jesus. And the good news of this seeing was written down from that generation to this, so that it can be read. Why? Because seeing and beholding takes place through reading and hearing the good news about Jesus. And the Bible as a whole, both old and new, is a window into that supreme worth and beauty of our triune God. And when we know and we see and we esteem and we love 
and we rejoice in and we praise God's supreme worth and beauty and we see it above all, above TikTok, above Netflix, above my pursuit, above my desires and dreams, and we see it above all. His majesty, His glory, His splendor, His worth is both exhibited and acknowledged and His fullness is received in us and returned. His splendor, His doxa, His kavot of the old shines upon us and into us and through us is reflected back to Him and back to the world at large. God is the beginning, He is the middle, and He is the end of the whole affair. And that is why, my dear brothers and sisters, we have to read the Bible supernaturally. We have to see. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we, we thank You so much that our hope is not in ourselves, but in You. And I know, Father, that there are many of us right now that are even thinking, sure, I just can't, it's too much, it's too difficult. I pray that you'll bring them a sense of comfort, a sense of seeing, that it's not up to them, it's not up to me, but it's up to you, Father. And I pray that today as we take the Lord's Supper, as we eat the bread, as we drink the fruit of the vine, that we will remember that not only is this a celebration of what we have in Jesus and what it is that he has done, but that it's through him that we are even able to comprehend a little of your worth, your beauty, your majesty, and your honor. And I pray as we eat the bread, as we drink the fruit of the vine, give us calm hearts, even in the heat of the day. And this week, as we pursue, as we turn, open our eyes, open our minds, Father, we want to see. We love you. We pray in your son's name. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.